Okay, today's lesson is 1.4 about extrema and average rates of change. Now, extrema is referring to the all of the maxima and all of the minima, which is the plural of maximum and minimum values of our function. So don't be scared off by the word, hopefully. Now, to start off with, we're going to talk about increasing and decreasing behavior. And I think the only thing that may cause you trouble is if you forget that you're always reading the graph just like you read a book and you go from left to right. And if we have our finger that we've used in our previous lessons and we follow this graph, you always start from left to right. So I'm going to take my finger and follow it. What am I doing? Clearly my graph is increasing. And as I go on this part of my graph, I am staying the same, so I'm constant. And on this part of my graph, I am going down, so we say it's decreasing. That's as easy as it is. The hardest part about it is how to write that mathematically. We're not using the, well, we, we will use the words, but we're also using interval notation. Keep in mind that a point itself, when we write our intervals, we'll talk about it. Actually, it's right here. Your intervals, when you talk about your intervals, are always going to be parentheses because the point itself is not increasing or decreasing. Okay? These are the technical. We have the words and we have the symbols. Okay? And basically, you can tell as you go from left to right on your graph, the graph is increasing. As the Y values are getting bigger, it's increasing. If my Y values are getting smaller, it's decreasing. If my Y values are staying the same, then it's constant. So let's go look at how we're going to do examples and how we have to answer our questions. Use the graph of each function to estimate intervals to the nearest half unit on which the function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. Support the answer numerically. Again, numerically is going to be looking at the tables. So if you want to look at the tables and want some help with the tables on your calculator, please come see me. Okay? So first off, we have a graph, a function, f of t equals 2t squared minus 8t plus 5. Always starting at the left, and that's that left arrow right here. So I am tracing my graph, and hopefully you can see that all along here, the direction that I'm going is down until I get to this point of my vertex. And what is that number? You can do that algebraically, or you can use your graph. So we're going from the smallest x value is negative infinity all the way to the number 2. Okay, always in parentheses. And this part of my graph is decreasing. And then from 2 all the way to the end, my values are going up all the way to the end. In this case, happens to be infinity. And that interval is where my graph is increasing. And that's all you have to write. Okay, let's look at this one. Um, again, I'm starting at negative infinity, so unless my graph specifically stops, I'm always going to start at negative infinity. And I'm going as far as this number right here, which clearly isn't negative 3. And so we can look over here on this piecewise function. They actually tell you where that change occurs. So it goes to negative 3.1, and my function is getting... The values are getting larger, so we say it's increasing. And then from negative 3.1, as far as the end of our graph, which is infinity, my values are remaining constant. So we say it's constant. And that's all we have for increasing and decreasing behavior. So you just need to practice to make sure you know how to write your intervals. Relative and absolute extrema. These are our max and mins. Okay? And they are basically our peaks and our valleys. Valleys and peaks. Okay? So keep in mind the difference that we have here is this point right here is a relative maximum. This point right here is an absolute maximum. What's the difference in the relative and the absolute? 
absolute is the absolute highest point on the graph. There's no place that this graph, if you trace your finger, do it ever get higher than that point. This is basically a peak. It is relative to this area. It is the highest point in that area. But you only have an absolute if you, you have your arrows going the same direction. Something to keep in mind. So down here, our absolute minimum is going to be this point right here. That's our absolute minimum. And then the other one that I have is a relative minimum. This, of course, would be a relative maximum because the arrows go on forever and ever, so there's not an absolute. If the graph ever goes above it, you cannot have it cannot be an absolute. So let's go answer some questions. We have a function f of x equals negative x to the fourth minus x cubed plus 3x squared plus 2x. So however you wish to do it. Uh, I'm just going to go in order. I'm going to find this point right here. There's a peak. And that peak is at the point negative 1.52. So negative 1.52. I'm actually naming the point. That is a relative max. It's not the absolute highest point of the graph. All right, if I keep going along my graph, I have this point down here that looks like it is at negative 0.5, comma, negative 0.5. And that point is a relative min. And then if I keep going along, I have this point here, which we're going to round and say it's 1, comma, 3. And that point, hopefully you can see, is an absolute max. Absolute because there is absolutely no point on that graph that is higher. Okay, our next example, g of x equals x to the fifth minus 2x to the fourth minus 2x cubed plus 3x squared. So I'm tracing my graph. The first point I come to is right here, which is at negative 1, 2. Negative 1, 2. Is it an absolute? Nope, because it keeps going over here, so I have a relative max. And then I keep following along. This, because it changes directions, there is a, a valley here, so I'm going to take that point, which is 0, 0, and call it a relative max min. It's a valley. It's not a peak. And then keep going along. I think that's negative 0.5. Nope, that's not negative. Where are my students when I need them? That's 0.5 comma 0.5. And that is a relative max. And then the last one that I have as I keep going along is down here. And we're going to round that to 2, comma, 1, 2, 3. We have 2, comma, negative 4, which is a relative min. And keep in mind, it's not a absol an absolute because my graph keeps going on forever and ever. So I don't have any, any absolute max or min values for this function. Okay. Okay, the last thing we have to talk about in this lesson is our average rate of change. Now keep in mind that we have discussed rate of change, or you have discussed rate of change before. Let's go with our highlighter here. When you talked about the slope, hopefully you remember that. And when you had the slope, we had a linear function, and it was a constant rate of change. Okay, the difference here is we are no longer talking about linear, but we are talking about nonlinear functions. So we don't have a slope, and we refer to it as an average rate of change. Okay? But I want to connect those two, so hopefully you can remember when you talked about slope earlier, it was the change in y over the change in x. Whether you did y sub 2 minus y sub 1, x sub 2 minus x sub 1, just a shortened way of writing it. Shortened way of writing it. 
So the slope is equal to the change in y over the change in x. Okay, the same thing is true for our average rate of change when we have a nonlinear function. Okay, so what they do is basically we're finding the slope of the secant line. And that secant line, remember secant from geometry, intersects your graph in two points. So whatever those two points are, between those x values, we're going to calculate the slope. So you can remember it. There's the fancy formula with it. It's the exact same thing. And the slope of our secant is still the change in y over the change in x. But what you have to remember is the slope of the secant is what we refer to as the average rate of change. So, but we're still taking our y values over our x values, okay? So, for the first one, we're trying to find the average rate of change on the given interval, okay? Pay attention that they have given us this interval. So that is my x sub 1, and this is my x sub 2. So I do have to go calculate each of those. So f of 2 is when I plug in 2 for x. So I have 2 cubed minus 2 times 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 2. And of course that equals, uh, we'll go down here. What does that simplify to? It becomes negative 4. Okay, and then we have to go calculate f of 3. So we've got 3 cubed minus 2 times 3 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 2. And that simplifies to 2. Lots of 2's here. Okay, so to calculate my secant, okay, or excuse me, to calculate my average rate of change, that's the slope of my secant line. All right, I'm going to take, now I find it easier if you keep these in mind first because you've got to go from x2 minus x1, okay? So we're going to start with those numbers and let's go with three minus two. And if I use three minus two, what number went with three? That was the two. And then we're going to subtract. And what number went with the 2 was <clears throat> negative 4. 2 minus negative 4. So when we simplify that, we end up with 6 over 1. So the slope of our secant, or the average rate of change, we say is 6. All right, last problem. Our interval this time is from negative 5 to negative 3. So I'm going to go calculate, it doesn't matter which one you do first, f of negative 5 equals negative 5 to the fourth minus 6 times negative 5 squared plus 4 times negative 5. And that simplifies to 455. And then I'm going to go calculate f of negative 3, and that is negative 3 to the fourth minus 6 times negative 3 squared plus 4 times negative 3. And that simplifies to 15. So now I'm going to go calculate the slope of my secant because that represents the average rate of change. All right, remember on the bottom, I'm going to put it in order that I have it, okay? So I'm going to go from negative 3 minus negative 5. And on top, whatever I plugged in for negative 3, I got 15. And what I plugged in for negative 5, I got 455. Now, when you simplify those, we're going to get negative 220. No, excuse me, that is not correct. If you simplify it, you get negative 440 over 2. And that simplifies to our final answer of negative 220. 
So the average rate of change of our graph on the interval from negative 5 to negative 3 is negative 220. And that is the end of lesson 1.4.